Hello, guys and gals, and this is part 10 of Phantasmagoria by Julia Bruce. It is an atlas of fabulous creatures, enchanted beings, and magical monsters. In the last one, we read about dragon slayers, vampire cats, the griffin, sphinx, and amut. In this episode, we'll be reading about Cerberus, black dogs and death hounds, the phoenix, the thunderbird, and the rock. Not to be confused with the wrestler slash actor Dwayne Johnson, who is also the rock, but he is not a bird. Anyways, um, well, we, but yeah, and last one we learned about all about Egyptian lore, about embalming and all that good stuff. We are ready for Cerberus. It says here, you might think that dying was bad enough, but if you were facing death in ancient Greece, that was just the start of your troubles. Before your soul could be at rest, it had to first cross the river Acheron with the sinister ferryman Charon. Uh, this is, then it was to then then it must fa oh, then it must face the terrifying three-headed monster Cerberus at the entrance of the underworld. Okay. Let's read about Hercules. It says, Cerberus and Hercules. Capturing Cerberus and bringing him back alive was the twelfth and final labor given to Hercules by King Eurysius. See page 94. Wait. I believe that that was the dragon one. So that would be number eight, part eight. If you want to read that, then you'll need to go to part, video eight, part eight. Okay. I believe. By now, Hercules was sick and tired of these labors. He stormed down to the underworld, so so frightening Charon, Charon that the ferryman agreed to take him across the river Acheron to Hades, even though he was not dead. Hercules then marched up to Hades and demanded that he let him borrow his dog. Hades agreed, but only on the condition that Hercules didn't use any weapon against Cerberus. It says here, first of all, Hercules single-handedly dragged Cerberus from the underworld. Wow. Anyways, um, we're going to read about this later, but anyway, let's keep going. Uh, so he, so Hercules wasn't allowed to use any weapons against Cerberus. This arrangement suited the super strong Hercules just fine. He simply gripped the monstrous dog by the neck and wrestled it to the ground. Then he flung it over his shoulder and carried it back to Eurystheus. Eurith the cowardly king had thought this last la labor was truly impossible and was so surprised and terrified to see Hercules return with a three-headed hellhound that he jumped into a large storage jar and hid. The mission complete, Hercules let Cerberus go and it bounded off back to Hades. Okay, now let's find out more about Cerberus here. It says, Hades, the land of the dead, was the gloomy place where all mortal, soul mortal souls were doomed to end up. The role of Cerberus was to guard the entrance to Hades. He would devour any living being that tried to get in. He was also there to ensure that no dead souls could escape from the underworld, which was ruled by Cerberus's master, the god of the dead, also called Hades. Terrifying to look upon, in some stories Cerberus had 50 or even 100 heads, but most tales describe him as having three. One like a lion's, one like a dog's, and the third like a wolf's, representing the past, present, and future. He was a huge beast the size of a bullock and had a mane of writhing snakes and a serpent's tail. Cerberus is not the only canine guardian of the dead. Myths of, from Central Asia, Serbia, oh no, Siberia rather, uh, India and Scandinavia all feature terrifying dog-like monsters that act as sentinels of the underworld. Okay, let's read about this thing. How to get past the Hound of Hell. Hercules is one of the very few people who managed to get past Cerberus. Those who did, those who did use various methods, those who did used various methods. Here are some tactics to employ if you ever find yourself facing the Hound of Hell. Lull him to sleep with soothing music. This is what the Greek musician Orpheus did when he traveled to the underworld to bring back his his dead wife, Eurydice. Uh, show him a little kindness. In one version of the Hercules story, the hero, the hero gently persuaded the monster to go with him rather than wrestling him to the ground. Drug him. The god Hermes used this method. He put the giant dog to sleep by giving him magical water from the river Lethe to, to drink. 
feed him. Roman hero Aeneas and, and renowned beauty Psyche both fed Cerberus honey cakes and sent him to sleep. If you try this, make sure to have a cake for each head. Um, wrestle him into submission. This is the least complicated approach, but keep in mind that you have to be as strong as Hercules to attempt something as dangerous as this. Above right, the three heads of Cer Cerberus represent past, present, and future. Sorry for this glare. Okay, now let's talk about the Wahila. Or I think that's how it's pronounced. The Wahila. Uh, in one of the most remote valleys in the world, part of, of the vast northwestern territory of Canada, there has been a string of unexplained and gruesome deaths. The Nahini Valley has become known as Headless Valley because several human bodies have been found there with one vile thing missing, their heads. Local people have no doubt that the creature responsible is the Wahila, a giant wolf-like beast of Indian legend, taller than, a taller than a wolf with a broad head and almost bear-like bulk and very long white fur. This beast hunts alone and keeps to the remotest corners of the valley, but it defends its territory mercilessly if any unfortunate person stumbles across it. Um, some scientists think that if such an animal exists, it could be a prehistoric species of wolf that has somehow survived until the present day. Native legends tell a different story, however, that the Wahila is an evil spirit with supernatural powers. Either way, this creature should be avoided at all costs. It says here, fact or myth, the Wahila of Canada's Nahini Valley is said to take the form of a giant and vicious white wolf. Okay, we are now ready for... Black Dogs and Death Hounds. Well, we could just start off... Oh, we're just going to start by reading the description here, as always. Then we'll read about the Beast of Dartmoor. Where they got ponies? Uh, terrifying phantom dogs from, de from, death for for oh, from death foretelling. Black hounds with fiery eyes and sulfurous breath. The flying human-headed Gab Gabriel hounds of northern England abound in the folk tales of Europe, particularly Britain. If you hear a blood-curdling howl on a deserted nighttime road, beware. Okay. Let's first of all read about the Dartmoor dude here. Beast of Dartmoor. Large uninhabited areas such as Dartmoor in the southwestern e in southwest England seem particularly likely to attract stories of mysterious and terrifying beasts. Sighting of large predatory animals on Dartmoor has occurred for hundreds of years. These may be some... There, there may, oh, these may have some basis in fact. Exotic animals, including lions and pumas, began, their, began to be brought into England from almost 400 years ago as part, of a menagerie, as part of menageries, private zoos for the very rich. Tales of phantom animals might stem from sightings of real animals that escape from such menageries. This is, oh, there's plenty of room and plenty of free-roaming prey on Dartmoor, including sheep and ponies for such an animal to survive virtually unseen for years. Even oh, escaped exotic animals may also explain mo more recent sightings of the so-called Beast of Dartmoor, said to be a giant cat-like creature. In 1976, a change in the law meant that anyone who kept a dangerous animal had to be, had to be far more accountable than they had been in the past. A few irresponsible owners may have let their animals loose, in the wild, rather than face the strict new rules. If the beast does exist, it may well be one of these, as is likely to be more than one animal. People have described creatures of different sizes and colors, some dog-like, some feline. Some have been positively identified as large dogs. In one case, the culprit was an escaped lion. Other sightings still remain mysterious. Okay, and it says here, this photograph taken in the south west of England is one of many perplexing snapshots of unidentified local beasts. Oh, see through. Okay, let's read about black dogs and death hounds. Dogs have been companions for humans for longer than any other animal. They are loyal and brave and have served humans in many ways. It is therefore particularly terrifying when such a familiar animal turns bad. Uh, apparitions of huge and ghastly black dogs with eyes like fiery coals are known all across Britain, and tales about them have been told since Viking times, well over a thousand, year, over a thousand years ago. Bargast, Black Shook, Girt Dog, Devil's Dandy, uh, Wished Hound, and 
Gittrish, are just a few examples. They are usually seen on dark, deserted roads and may track helpless tra- may may track hapless travelers for miles, bringing misfortune or foretelling death or dis- or disaster. It is very unwise to approach such a black dog. If it is, if they attack, their wounds can be terrible, failing to heal or leading to paralysis or even death. Okay, it says up here. Um, in the scene from Arthur Conan Doyle's *The Hound of the Baskervilles*, the terrifying black dog of the tale, the of the ta- title, is shot dead. Okay, uh, pack hunters. Sometimes spectral hounds appear in packs, such as the Gabriel Hound or Gabble Ratchets in Northern England. The Wild Hunt in Germany and the the Woden's Hunt in Scandinavia. The Gabriel's hounds have human heads and fly in the air. If they hover over a house, and someone inside is someone inside is soon going to die. In Wales, corpse dogs, the swim, Anwin hounds of fairy, uh, Fairyland, are usually invisible or appear as huge white hounds with red eyes and ears. They howl horribly, prophesying death and seeking out corpses and the souls of the dead. They are led either by the devil or by a monstrous black-faced huntsman. Gwen. Ap Nud, uh, oh, by the blackface huntsman Gwyn Ap Nud. Uh, Scotland has its own tradition of phantom hounds. Farmers in the Highlands are always very wary of any mysterious barking or howling drifting over the moors. This is likely the call of Cusith, a an enormous green hound with long braided tail arched over its back. This cow-sized canine runs like lightning, bellowing after its prey. Only hearing its terrifying howl, oh, on hearing its terrifying howl, farmers who live nearby will lock up their womenfolk for fear the hound would abduct them and take them to a fairy mound to supply milk for hungry fairy children. Okay. Uh, next we have a map about fabulous birds. And we're just going to read this. I'm probably going to just go over all these maps in a different video. Fabulous birds. The immortal phoenix lives for centuries before being consumed by flames and then emerging reborn from its own ashes. This is one of the best known of all mythological birds. But there are others too. The awe-inspiring thunderbird of the Native Americans, Native North Americans rather, the giant rock of of the Arabian Nights stories, and the benevolent and beautiful Cymurg of Persia, now Iran. Russian stories about winged and feathered creatures include the magnificent firebird, whose feathers burn like flames, and the beautiful but deadly winged siren, who bewitches the unwary with their haunting songs. And uh, we are just going to get right into this. And read about the phoenix. Fantastical fact. It says, um, in Russian folklore, the feathers of of the beautiful and mysterious firebird glow like gold, red, and orange flames of Feathers continue to glow even at when removed, bringing light and hope to the bear, to the hearts of men. Okay, now let's read this. It says the phoenix, famous for dying in flames before being reborn, the phoenix is the most dramatic of mythical birds. The classic phoenix legends are associated with ancient Arabian Egypt, but a similar type of bird can be found in the stories of other cultures, including those of China and Japan. But let's talk about. Feng, Feng Hong and Hu O. Oh. And I think that this is probably where they got the um, Pokemon Ho O oh from. I'm just guessing. Because it's kind of similar to Ho O, oh, except it's like Hu O. Oh. And I'm like Ho O, Hu O, Hu O. Oh, anyway. Uh, the Phoenix like Chinese Feng, Feng Hong uh, has a snake's neck, a, sh- a swallow's face, and a cock's beak. In other words, a rooster's beak. Its beast. Uh, its breast was that of was that of a goose, and it was had the back of a tortoise and the tail of a fish, prized as an emblem of good luck. And uh, uh, prized as an emblem of good luck, the Feng Hong sang beautiful songs. The Japanese Ho O was in fact two birds, the Ho being the male and the O O the female. They resembled the Feng Hong in looks, the appearance of the Ho O was believed to mark the birth of a good ruler. 
It says, in the 100-year-old embroidery, a gorgeously colored Chinese phoenix sits resplendently on a tree surrounded by lesser birds. Beautiful. Okay, now let's see. The Arabian, Fe the Arabian phoenix, according to tales passed down by ancient Greeks and Roman writers, was the size of an eagle. Some say it, it had glowing red and gold feathers, while others described it as having a purple body and a rich blue or azure tail, with a tuft of feathers on its head. Its song was sweet and tuneful, uh, living near a shady well in the wilds of Arabia. It would wake up at daybreak and break into captivating song. The phoenix did not kill or harm anything for its food, oh, anything for its food, but lived instead on droplets of morning dew that formed during the night. Now, uh, reborn in flames. There are only a single. Um, there was only a single phoenix existing at any one time, but it lived a long life. Some say 500 years, while others claimed it survived for 1,461 years, or even 12,994 years. It was at that at the moment of its death that the bird's magical nature became obvious. As its life was coming to an end, it would build a nest from sweet-smelling twigs and spices such as cinnamon. Then, sitting in the nest, the bird set it set it on fire, and was engulfed by the flames. Some say that the phoenix was consumed by the raging flames to rise again from the smoldering ashes. Another version says a worm emerged from the ashes, which turns into a tiny bird on the second day, and fully grown phoenix on the third. The tears of the phoenix were said to have the magical power to heal or even temporarily protect a person from death. It says, um... This is the traditional image of the phoenix rising again from the flames of its funeral pyre. The phoenix is often used as a symbol of rebuilding and rebirth. Okay, we are now ready for the thunderbird, not the car. The actual bird. It says, Native American people have may have once looked up in the skies with fear during thunderstorms. Their legend tell that Every clap of thunder is the wing beat of a massive flying terror, the Thunderbird. Every lightning flash is a blink of the Thunderbird's giant eyes. Okay, let's see. The Thunderbird and the Whale. I think I know where this is going. It says, Once there was a monstrous whale that attacked and killed others of its own kind, once until there were no more whales for people to hunt. From his home high on the mountain, Thunderbird saw what was happening and became angry. As long as two two war canoes oh became angry. As long as two war canoes with a giant beacon uh, oh, wait, wait. Uh, oh it is as long as two war canoes with a giant beacon eyes like glowing coals. Thunderbird soared from the high from his high mountain. He plunged into the sea and grabbed the whale with its vast claws. There was a huge battle between the whale and Thunderbird, and a great shaking, jumping, and a great shaking, jumping up and trembling of the earth, and a rolling up of the great waters. The oceans fell and then rose again. Canoes were flung ashore, and many people were killed in the mayhem. Finally, Thunderbird managed to drag the whale out of the ocean and into the air. When he had flown high enough, he dropped the whale, and the battle continued on the ground until finally Thunderbird won and the people could hunt whales once more. Fantastical fact. In the story of the fight between the whale and the Thunderbird, the earth shakes and the ocean roll away and floods back again. This refers to the effects of real-life earthquakes and tsunamis, giant ocean waves. Okay, it says, flying above the earth, the Thunderbird pulls clouds together and it's with it with its giant wings, creating storms and rain as it went, as well as flashing sheet, sheet lightning from its eyes. It carries, it carried glowing snakes in its claws that made lightning bolts. Thunderbird had feathers and shimmering colors. Oh, had feathers of shimmering colors and rows of sharp teeth in its giant beak. The power of the Thunderbird was the greatest power in the whole universe. The power of hot and cold clashing above the clouds. Some people believe that. There were many Thunderbirds. These, be these beings, they thought, could shapeshift into human form 
by shrugging off their feathers and opening their beaks to reveal human faces inside. In this form, they might marry into human tribes. Although Thunderbird was frightening, he was also a protector and a friend to humans, as the story of the Thunderbird and the whale shows. It says, A stern image of the Thunderbird atop this totem pole carved by the native people of Vancouver, Canada. Totem poles are usually created to record stories, events, and family relationships. And it says Raven. In May stories from North America, Raven is the creator of the world. Before the time of people, Raven lived in the spirit world, but he got bored and he flew away from there, carrying a stone in his beak. After a while, he became tired of carrying the stone and dropped it into the ocean, where it grew and grew until it formed the world. Another story tells how Raven found a clam and opened it to discover creatures inside. They were timid and frightened, but he coaxed them out into the world. These were the first men, but Raven got bored with the creatures and was about to put them back in the shell when he decided to look for a female human instead. He eventually found some trapped inside a different type of shell and was greatly amused by watching the men and the women meet and interact. From that day on, Raven became uh, Raven was very protective of humans. Above, Raven, who featured in the creation stories of North America, was a great trickster. Okay, and we are ready for one last one. The Rock, not to be confused with Dwayne Johnson. Though he's probably as strong as a rock. Okay, The Rock, as you can see, The Rock. Okay. Large enough to scoop up, fo scoop up a fully grown elephant in, an, in its gigantic claws, The Rock, or Ruck, was a fantastic bird of, of Arabian legend. It was terrifying to look at resembling a colossal eagle or vulture with horns, as well as eating elephants, the rock was said to have a taste for human flesh. Oh, goody. Okay, it says, For all the world, like an eagle, but one indeed of enormous size, and so strong that it will seize an elephant in its talons and carry him high into the air and drop him so that he is smashed to pieces, Having so killed him, the bird swoops down on him and eats, eats him at leisure. Those are the words of the Italian adventurer Marco Polo describing, the, describing a rock 700 years ago. He added that the rock was usually white and had a wingspan of 15, 15 meters, 50 feet, and feathers 7 meters, 23 feet long. When it flew, the beating of its wings caused high winds and its flight created lightning. In other stories, rocks were attracted to human flesh and would pick dead bodies off battlefields. Perhaps the best-known encounters with, with the rock were those of Sinbad in the Arabian Nights stories. Okay, let's see what it says here. The majestic rock was able to carry enormous creatures in its massive talons, such as elephants and, and rhinoceroses. And it looks like it has both there. Okay. Let's read about Sinbad and the rock. I didn't know that Dwayne Johnson had ever met Sinbad. That's good to know. On his second voyage, the in his second vo voyage of adventure, Sinbad found himself deserted on by his shipmates on a beautiful island, and there was no obvious way to escape. He decided to explore his island prison and saw in the distance a huge white dome. He approached it with caution and walked all around it, but could find no way in. Suddenly, the sky darkened and a huge shape came flying towards him. He realized the shape was a rock, a gigantic and monstrous bird, and the dome was in fact its egg. The bird came to rest on the egg, settled its wings around it, and fell asleep. Sinbad saw his chance to escape. He took his turban off the, he took, he took his turban off his head and unwound the, the long length of material. He used it to tie himself to the sleeping bird's giant foot and waited until morning. Sure enough, when dawn broke, the great bird lifted off into the air, completely unaware that Sinbad was lashed to its claws. They flew so high that it terrified Sinbad. Uh, the, oh. uh, they flew so high that the terrified Sinbad thought that they may, must surely be reaching, they have surely reached the heavens. When the bird came down to land, Sinbad hurriedly untied the turban and stole away before the bird noticed him. On the fifth voyage, Sinbad came across the rocks the rocks again. In this story, Sinbad's shipmates destroy a rock egg and it and its angry parents wreck the ship by dropping rocks on it. 
Despite Sinbad's warnings, his foolhardy shipmates destroy an egg, uh, a rock egg, inviting the wrath of its parents. So there they are, getting bombarded by rocks. I guess they call it rock because it drops rocks. I don't know. Anyways. Um, it says here, um, the elephant bird shown here could have gr have given rise to stories about rocks. A six-foot-tall man would barely reach the top of this giant's thigh. Okay, let's talk about the elephant bird. Okay. But first of all, we're going to read this, just because it's short. Despite Sinbad's experience, rocks were supposed to, supposed to never land on Earth, but only on the mountain Quaff, uh, the center of the world in the beliefs of ancient Arabia. Okay, let's read about the elephant bird, and then we're going to call this quits. Um, elephant bird. Stories of the legendary rock may have been had some basis. In fact, Marco Polo said that the rock came from the island of Madagascar off the east coast of Africa. This large island has its own unique collection of animals and birds that are not found anywhere else in the world. Until about 400 years ago, when it became extinct, the local wildlife included a huge bird that scientists called um, Aporinix Maximus, or the elephant bird. It measured 3 meters, 10 feet in height, and weighed nearly half a ton. Its eggs were over one meter, three feet around, an omelet made from just one ap aparinus egg would feed at least 50 people. Earlier explorers may have seen the bird itself or have had seen, or had seen the massive bones and eggs and thought that they belonged to the fabled rock. In fact, the elephant bird was flightless, but some people think that large flightless birds such as aparinus and ostriches may have been taken for rock chicks. Just imagine the size an adult would be if the ostrich were only a chick. And with that, we are going to call this one quits, and we will pick up with the Cymurg. Um, feathered fiends, and then we're going to go into water creatures. We are almost done. I think that this is going to be about it. We, this has been a reading from Phantasmagoria, an atlas of fabulous creatures, enchanted beings, and magical monsters by Julia Bruce. If you like this content, make sure you like and subscribe and ring the bell so you know when I upload. Um, also, if you want to support me in any way, all that information is in the description below. And as always, thanks for watching everyone, and have a great day.